After the fall of the AWA, but before ECW would go extreme, there was a huge void in the American wrestling market for a third brand. And one such promotion would answer the call, featuring stars of the past, of the future, and somehow, surprisingly, even some talent that was currently signed to WWF at the time. Brought to you by the brain of Jim Cornette and the musical mind behind such acts as LL Cool J, the Beastie Boys, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers, they managed to accomplish all this and so much more in less than five years. So, what is this magical promotion that's candle shed a brief but lovely light? Well, it's the subject of this episode. Because today... A big thank you to all of my Patreon supporters such as Caleb Robinson, Cool Ass Jack, and Raiding Jaguar. As the times went from the 80s to the 90s, Wrestling 2 was going through... some changes. WWF had spent the previous decade taking the industry to never-before-seen heights, and as already covered in a previous video, Jim Crockett Promotions gave way to become WCW. However, World Championship Wrestling was not off to a solid start. Under the management of Jim Hurd, an outsider who knew nothing about the wrestling business that wanted Ric Flair to shave his head and go by the name Spartacus, many were soon realizing that WCW would not exactly be a continuation of the tradition hailing from the NWA. Flair himself would leave to join Vince McMahon and the WWF, bringing the NWA world title with him. But he wasn't the only departure, as WCW would soon no longer have the services of one, James E. Cornette. In addition, WCW had also alienated two other prominent figures in the industry, Stan Lane, who worked for the CWA, the AWA, and also Jim Crockett Promotions, as well as Sandy Scott, who was part of the Flying Scots tag team with his brother George, both of which also worked for Jim Crockett Promotions backstage as well. These three had a lot to offer, and would rally against the changing phase of the industry that was no longer representing classic Southern wrestling. And they figured that if no one else was going to do it, then they would just have to do it themselves. Smoky Mountain Wrestling, professional wrestling like it used to be and the way you like it. But building a promotion requires money. And so they received financial backing from music producer and the co-founder of Def Jam Records, Rick Rubin. Now, let's be clear. While all these individuals did contribute to the founding of Smoky Mountain Wrestling, everything was still primarily the vision of one man. Jim Cornette. And what exactly was his vision? Well, as Mick Foley would describe it, SMW was for old-time fans who still believed in good guys and bad guys, and to whom cheating was still a reason to get upset. Wrestling is of course a niche product, but within that niche, there are several other smaller niches as well. Which is exactly why some people feel that wrestling was never meant to be a homogenous national product, let alone a global one. Not to mention that you also have to take in consideration that the times, they are a-changing. And while the Attitude Era was still a few years away, fans were beginning not to react to things the same way they used to. And you thought this was just a problem for today's wrestling. Maybe it was Vince McMahon exposing the business in 1989, maybe it was a symptom of going national, maybe it's just the natural evolution of the industry. No matter what it was, the major promotion seemed desperate to get with the times, and they also seemed like they were trying to figure out what the times were. But Jim Cornette wasn't. Jim wanted the kind of wrestling that he grew up on. He wanted the industry to be the place he was first a part of and he was willing to bet that he wasn't the only one. It's not whether you can wrestle anymore, it's whether you want to wear a funny costume. And you thought that Jim Cornette complaining was just something he did about today's wrestling. Smoky Mountain Wrestling began their taping in October of 1991, with shows first airing in February of 1992. The original goal was to be a territory that stemmed from South Carolina to Georgia. However, their primary home base was that of Tennessee. Then, just a little over a year later, what is perhaps the most surprising accomplishment was signing deals with both WWF and WCW, where their talent could be showcased to a larger audience, which led to many high-profile matches for the company, such as the Heavenly Bodies and the Rock and Roll Express going against each other at both Super Brawl 3 and Survivor Series 1993. And you thought Tony Khan invented talent exchange. But this talent exchange wasn't all one-sided, as it did work the other way around too, most notably with the Brothers of Destruction facing off against each other in SMW before Glenn Jacobs ever became Kane. And that wasn't all, as Smoky Mountain Wrestling also had a brief working relationship with the NWA as well. What was left of the National Wrestling Alliance was focusing on ECW, then Eastern Championship Wrestling as their top promotion. But alas, after Shane Douglas threw down the NWA title and Eastern 
became extreme, another tournament would take place to recrown a new NWA World Champion. Chris Candido would wind up winning this tournament, which featured many Smoky Mountain talents, and Candido would primarily defend his title at SMW events. However, three months later in February of 1995, Candido would drop the belt to Dan the Beast Severin, who would opt to become a traveling champion instead of just focusing his efforts in the Smoky Mountain area, thus restricting their access to the 10 pounds of gold. Now, that's not to say that Smoky Mountain didn't have titles of their own, because they definitely did, such as the United States Junior Heavyweight Championship, first and last held by Bobby Blaze, the SMW Tag Team titles, first and last won by the Heavenly Bodies, although it was first won by Stan Lane and Tom Pritchard, and last won by Pritchard and Jimmy Del Rey. And then there was the Beat the Champ TV title, first won by Tracy Smothers and last won by Bobby Blaze yet again. This championship was designed around the concept that a random challenger would be selected to contest for the belt every week, and the winner of each bout would get $1,000. If the champion won five weeks in a row, he would receive a $5,000 bonus and the belt would be vacated to begin anew. And of course, there was also the Smoky Mountain Wrestling Heavyweight title. This championship was first won by Brian Lee, and last won by, well, we'll get to that in a little bit bit, but before we do, we're going to have to talk about what caused the fall of Smoky Mountain Wrestling. While the promotion was well received by its core fanbase, that fanbase just wasn't large enough. There was too much competition from the major companies. Wrestling was caught at a low between the boom of the 80s and 90s, and Vince McMahon's steroid trial wasn't helping. But the biggest hardship was that they were never able to secure a TV deal that was profitable enough to keep things going, especially after Rick Rubin pulled funding. Cornette would shut down the promotion in November of 1995 and then signed on to work for the WWF. However, in a last ditch effort, the promotion's name did linger on a bit until the end of the year, with an interpromotional feud being set up between Smoky Mountain Wrestling and the USWA. The basis of this rivalry was a statewide turf war. We laugh until we realize what a bad name you give the state of Tennessee. With the USWA's Jerry Lawler winning the SMW title, but after the promotion was officially shut down, with Tommy Rich being the last champion while the promotion was still up and running. But either way, the belt would be deactivated on December 30th, 1995. Smoky Mountain Wrestling may have been short-lived, but it spoke very loudly to a group of people that knew what traditional Southern-style wrestling was and knew that's what they wanted. Refusing to let the mega companies rule the roost, SMW was a territory promotion that just couldn't stay afloat during national wrestling times, even with a huge pool of talent on their roster. But nevertheless, serving the Appalachian wrestling fan community, Jim Cornette was able to briefly hold on to a style of wrestling that has mostly been forgotten by many modern fans today. However, if you look hard enough, it is and always will be there for anyone who wants to look through the smoke. Well, there you go. The history of Smoky Mountain Wrestling. What are some of your favorite SMW moments? Let me know down in the comments, and please make sure you give this video a like and that you're subscribed to this channel. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, Dave knows.